Hello everyone, let's get back to reading Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And here's to hoping that I can read a little better than I've done previously for you. The Counterpane Upon waking next morning, about daylight, I found Quickwig's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. The counterpane was of patchwork, full of odd little party-colored squares and triangles, and this arm of his tattooed all over with an interminable Cretan labyrinth of a figure, no two parts of which were of one precise shade, owing, I suppose, to his keeping his arm at sea unmethodically in sun and shade. His shirt sleeves irregularly rolled up at various times, this same arm of his, I say, looked for all the world like a strip of that same patchwork quilt. Indeed, partly lying on it as the arm did when I first awoke, I could hardly tell it from the quilt. They so blended their hues together, and it was only by the sense of weight and pressure that I could tell that Quig was hugging me. My sensations were strange. Let me try to explain them. When I was a child, I well remember a somewhat similar circumstance that befell me. Whether it was a reality or a dream, I could never entirely settle. The circumstance was this. I had been cutting up some caper or other. I think it was trying to crawl up the chimney, as I had seen a little sweep do a few days previous. And my stepmother, who somehow or other was all the time whipping me, or sending me to bed supperless. My mother dragged me by the legs out of the chimney and packed me off to bed, though it was only two o'clock in the afternoon of the 21st June, the longest day in the year in our hemisphere. I felt dreadfully, but there was no help for it, so upstairs I went to my little room in the third floor, undressed myself as slowly as possible so as to kill time, and, with a bitter sigh, got between the sheets. I lay there dismally, calculating that sixteen entire hours must elapse before I could hope for a resurrection. Sixteen hours in bed. The small of my back ached to think of it. And it was so light too, the sun shining in at the window, and a great rattling of coaches in the streets, and the sound of gay voices all over the house. I felt worse and worse. At last I got up, dressed, and softly, going down in my stockinged feet, sought out my stepmother, and suddenly threw myself at her feet, beseeching her as a particular favor to give me a good slippering for my misbehavior, anything, indeed, but condemning me to lie abed such an unendurable length of time. But she was the best and most conscientious of stepmothers, and back I had to go to my room. For several hours I lay there, brought awake, feeling a great deal worse than I have ever done since, even from the greatest subsequent misfortunes. At last I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a dose, and slowly waking up from it, half steeped in dreams, I opened my eyes and the before sunlit room was now wrapped in utter darkness. Instantly I felt a shock running through all of my frame. Nothing was to be seen, and nothing was to be heard, but a supernatural hand seemed placed in mine. My arm hung over the counterpane, and the nameless, unimaginable, silent form or phantom to which the hand belonged seemed closely seated to my bedside, for what seemed ages piled on ages, I lay there frozen with the most awful fears, not daring to drag away my hand, yet ever thinking that if I could but steer it one single inch, the horrid spell would be broken. I knew not how this consciousness at last glided away from me, but waking in the morning, I shudderingly remember it all, and for days and weeks and months afterwards, I lost myself in confounding attempts to explain the mystery. Nay, to this very hour, I often puzzle myself with it. 
Now, take away the awful fear, and my sensations at feeling the supernatural hand in mine were very similar, in their strangeness, to those which I experienced on waking up and seeing Quick Quig's pagan arm thrown around me. But at length, all the past night's events soberly recurred, one by one, in fixed reality, and then I lay only alive to the comical predicament. For though I tried to move his arm, unlock his bridegroom clasp, yet, sleeping as he was, he still hugged me tightly, as though naught but death should part us twain. I now strove to rouse him, quick, quick, but his only answer was a snore. I then rolled over, my neck feeling as if it were in a horse collar, and suddenly felt a slight scratch. Throwing aside the counterpane, there lay the tomahawk sleeping by the savage's side, as if it were a hatchet-faced baby. A pretty pickle, truly, thought I. A bed here in a strange house in the broad day, with a cannibal and a tomahawk. Quick, quick, in the name of goodness, quick, quick, wake! At length, by dint of much wriggling and loud and incessant expostulations, upon the unbecomingness of his hugging a fellow male in that matrimonial sort of style, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently he drew back his arm, shook himself all over like a Newfoundland dog just from the water, and sat up in bed, stiff as a pikestaff, looking at me and rubbing his eyes, as if he did not altogether remember how I came to be there, though a dim consciousness of knowing something about me seemed slowly dawning over him. Meanwhile, I lay quietly eyeing him, having no serious misgivings now, and bent upon narrowly observing so curious a creature. When at last his mind seemed made up, touching the character of his bedfellow, and he became, as it were, reconciled to the fact, he jumped out upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds gave me to understand that, if it pleased me, he would dress first and then leave me to dress afterwards, leaving the whole apartment to myself. Thinks I, quick, quick. Under the circumstances, this is a very civilized overture, but the truth is, these savages have an innate sense of delicacy. Say what you will, it is marvelous how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Quick Quick because he treated me with so much civility and consideration, while I was guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from the bed and watching all his toilet motions, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Quick Quick you don't see every day. He and his ways were well worth unusual regarding. He commenced dressing a tub by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by, and then, still minus his trousers, he hunted up his boots. What under the heavens he did it for I cannot tell, but his next movement was to crush himself, boots in hand and hat on, under the bed, when from sundry violent gaspings and strainings I inferred he was hard at work, booting himself though by no law or propriety that I ever heard of, is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. But Quick Quig, do you see, was a creature in the transition state, neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manner. His education was not yet completed, he was an undergraduate, if he had not been a small degree civilized, he very probably would not have troubled himself with boots at all, and then, if he had not been still a savage, he never would have dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. At last he emerged with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes, and began creaking and limping about the room, as if not being much accustomed to boots, his pair of damp wrinkled cowhide ones probably not made to order either, rather pinched and tormented him at the first go off of a bitter cold morning. Seeing now that there were no curtains to the window, 
and that the street being very narrow, the house opposite commanded a plain view into the room, and observing more and more the in indecorous figure that Quick Quick made, staving about with little else but his hat and boots on, I begged him as well as I could to accelerate his toilet somewhat, and particularly to get into his pantaloons as soon as possible. He complied, and then proceeded to wash himself. At that time in the morning any Christian would have washed his face, but Quig Quig, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his ablutions to his chest, arms and hands. He then donned his waistcoat, and taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand center table, dipped it into water and commenced lathering his face. I was watching to see where he kept his razor, when lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on the boot, and striding up to the bit of mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping, or rather harpooning, of his cheeks. Thinks I, quick quick, this is using Roger's best cutlery with a vengeance. Afterwards, I wondered the less at this operation, when I came to know of what fine steel the head of a harpoon is made, and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped up in his great pilot monkey jacket, and sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. Breakfast I quickly followed suit, and descending into the bar room, accosted the grinning landlord very pleasantly. I cherished no malice towards him, though he had been skylarking with me not a little in the matter of my bedfellow. However, a good laugh is a mighty good thing, and rather too scarce a good thing, the more's the pity. So, if any one man, in his own proper person, affords stuff for a good joke to anybody, let him not be backward, but let him cheerfully allow himself to spend and be spent in that way. And the man that has anything bountifully laughable about him, be sure there is more in that man than you perhaps think for. The bar room was now full of the boarders who had been dropping in the night previous, and whom I had not yet had a good look at. They were nearly all whalemen chief mates and second mates and third mates and sea carpenters and sea coopers and sea blacksmiths and harpooners and shipkeepers. A brown and brawny company with bosky beards and unshorn shaggy set all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. You could pretty plainly see how long each one had been ashore. This young fellow's healthy cheek is like a sun-toasted pear in hue, and would seem to smell almost as musky. He cannot have been three days landed from his Indian voyage. That man next him looks a few shades lighter. You might say a touch of satin wood is in him. In the complexion of a third still lingers a tropic ton, but slightly bleached withal. He doubtless has tarried whole weeks ashore, but who could show a cheek like Quig Quig, which barred with various tints seemed like the Andes' western slope, to show forth in one array contrasting climates, zone by zone. Grub ho! now cried the landlord, flinging open a door, and in we went to breakfast. They say that men who have seen the world thereby become quite at ease in manner, quite self-possessed, in company. Not always, though. Ledyard, the great New England traveller, and Mungo Park, the Scotch one, of all men they possess the least assurance in the parlour. But perhaps the mere crossing of Siberia in a sledge drawn by dogs, as Ledyard did, or the taking a long solitary walk on an empty stomach in the negro heart of Africa, which was the sum of poor Mungo's performance. This kind of travel, I say, 
may not be the be- very best mode of attaining a high social polish. Still, for the most part, that sort of thing is to be had anywhere. These reflections, just here, are occasioned by the circumstance that after we were all seated at the table and I was preparing to hear some good stories about whaling, to my no small surprise, nearly every man maintained a profound silence. And not only that, but they looked embarrassed. Yes, here were a set of sea dogs, many of whom without the slightest bashfulness had boarded great whales on the high seas, entire strangers to them, and dueled them dead without winking. And yet, here they sat at a social breakfast table, all of the same calling, all of kindred tastes, looking round as sheepishly at each other as though they had never been out of sight of some sheepfold among the green mountains. A curious sight, these bashful bears, these timid warrior whalemen. But as for Quickquig, why, Quickquig sat there among them, at the head of the table too, it so chanced, as cool as an icicle. To be sure, I cannot say much for his breeding. His greatest admirer could not have cordially justified his bringing his harpoon into breakfast with him, and using it there without ceremony, reaching over the table with it to the imminent jeopardy of many heads, and grappling the beef sticks towards him. But that was certainly very coolly done by him, and every one knows that in most people's estimation to do anything coolly is to do it genteelly. We will not speak of all of Quickquake's peculiarities here, how he has chewed coffee and hot rolls and applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks done rare. Enough that when breakfast was over, he withdrew, like the rest, into the public room, lighted his tomahawk pipe, and was sitting there quietly, digesting and smoking with his inseparable hat on, when I sallied out for a stroll. The Street If I had been astonished at first, catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Quigquig circulating among the polite society of a civilized town. That astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest-looking nondescripts from foreign parts. Even in Broadway and Chestnut Streets, Mediterranean mariners will sometimes jostle the affrighted ladies. Regent Street is not unknown to Lascars and Malays, and at Bombay and the Apollo Green, live Yankees have often scarred the natives. But New Bedford beats all Water Street and Wapping. In these last-mentioned haunts, you see only sailors. But in New Bedford, actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners, savages outright, many of whom yet carry on their bones unholy flesh. It makes a stranger stare. But besides the Phrygians, Tongatobors, Aeromangons, Panagians, and Brigians, I have no idea how to pronounce these, I just guessed. And besides the wild specimens of the whaling craft, which unheeded reel about the streets, you will see other sights still more curious, certainly more comical. There weekly arrive in his town scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshire men, all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery. They are mostly young, of stalwart frames, fellows who have felled forests and now seek to drop the axe and snatch the whale lands. Many are as green as the green mountains whence they came. In some things you would think them but a few hours old. Look there, that chap strutting round the corner. He wears a beaver hat and swallowtail coat, girdled with a sailor belt and sheath knife. Here comes another with a sou'wester and a bombazine cloak. No 
downbred dandy will compare with a country-bred one. I mean, a downright bumpkin dandy. A fellow that, in the dog days, will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands. Now, when a country dandy like this takes it into his head to make a distinguished reputation and joins the great whale fishery, you should see the comical things he does upon reaching the seaport. In bespeaking his sea outfit, he orders bell buttons to his waistcoats, straps to his canvas trousers. Ah, poor hayseed, how bitterly will burst those straps in the first howling gale when thou art driven, straps, buttons and all, down the throat of the tempest. But think not that this famous town has only harpooners, cannibals and bumpkins to show her visitors. Not at all. Still, New Bedford is a queer place, had it not been for us whalemen. That tract of land without this day perhaps have been in as howling condition as the coast of Labrador. As it is, parts of her back country are enough to frighten one. They look so bony. The town itself is perhaps the dearest place to live in, in all New England. It is a land of oil, true enough, but not like Cannon, a land also of corn and wine. The streets do not run with milk, nor in the springtime do they pave them with fresh eggs. Yet, in spite of this, nowhere in all America will you find more partition-like houses, parks and gardens, more opulent than in New Bedford. Whence came they? How planted upon this once scraggy scoria of a country? Go and gaze upon the iron emblematical harpoons round yonder lofty mansion, and your question will be answered. Yes, all these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans. One and all, they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. Can her Alexander perform a feat like that? In New Bedford, fathers, they say, give whales for dowers to their daughters and portion off their nieces with a few porpoises apiece. You must go to New Bedford to see a brilliant wedding, for they say they have reservoirs of oil in every house and every night recklessly burn their lengths of spermacity candles. In summertime, the town is sweet to see, full of fine maples, long avenues of green and gold, and in August, high in air, the beautiful and bountiful horse chestnuts, ca candelumbra-wise, proffer the passerby their tapering upright cones of congregated blossoms. So omnipotent is art, which in many a district of New Bedford, has superincluded bright terraces of flowers upon the barren refuse rocks thrown aside at creation's final day. And the women of New Bedford, they bloom like their own red roses. But roses only bloom in summer, whereas the fine carnation of their cheeks is perennial, as sunlight in the seventh heavens. Elsewhere match the bloom of theirs, ye cannot, save in Salem, where they tell me the young girls breathe such musk, their sailor sweethearts smell them miles off shore, as though they were drawing nigh the odorous Molaccas, instead of the Puritanic sands. The Chapel In this same New Bedford there stands a whaleman's chapel, and few are the moody fishermen, shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific, who failed to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I am sure that I did not. Returning from my first morning stroll, I again sailed out upon this special errand. The sky had changed from clear sunny cold to driving sleet and mist. Wrapped myself in my shaggy jacket of cloth called bearskin, I fought my way against the stubborn storm. Entering, I found a small scattered congregation of sailors, and sailors' wives and widows. A muffled silence reigned, 
only broken at times by shrieks of the storm. Each silent worshipper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other, as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. The chaplain had not yet arrived, and there these silent islands of men and women sat steadfastly eyeing several marble ta tablets with black borders masoned into the wall on either side of the pulpit. Three of them rang something like the following, but I do not pretend to quote. Sacred to the memory of John Talbot, who at the age of 18 was lost overboard, near the Isle of Desolation of Patagonia, November 1st, 1836. This tablet is erected to his memory by his sister. Sacred to the memory of Robert Long, Willis Ellery, Nathan Coleman, Walter Kenny, Seth Macy, and Samuel Gleig, forming one of the boat's crews of the ship Eliza, who were towed out of sight by a whale on the offshore ground in the Pacific, December 31st, 1839. This marble is here placed by their surviving shipmates. Sacred to the memory of the late Captain Ezekiel Hardy, who in the bows of his boat was killed by a sperm whale on the coast of Japan, August 3rd, 1833. This tablet is erected to his memory by his widow. Shaking off the sleet from my eyes glazed hat and jacket, seated myself near the door and turning sideways, was surprised to see Quick Quick near me. Affected by the solemnity of the scene, there was a wandering gaze of incredulous curiosity in his countenance. This savage was the only person present who seemed to notice my entrance, because he was the only one who could not read, and therefore was not reading those frigid inscriptions on the wall. Whether any of the relatives of the seamen whose names appeared there were now among the congregation, I knew not. But so many were the unrecorded accidents in the fishery, and so plainly did several women present wear the countenance, if not the trappings of some unceasing grief, that I feel sure that here before me were assembled those in whose unhealing hurts the sight of those bleak tablets sympathetically caused the old wounds to bleed afresh. Oh, ye yeah, whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass, who standing among flowers can say, Here, here lies my beloved, ye you know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these. What bitter blanks in those black-bordered marbles which cover no ashes! What despair in those immovable inscriptions! What deadly voids and unbidden infidelities in the lines that seem to gnaw upon all faith and refuse resurrections to the beings who have placelessly perished without a grave! As well might those tablets stand in the cave of Elphanta as here. In what senses of living creatures, the dead of mankind are included? Why is it that a universal proverb says of them, that they tell no tales, though containing more secrets than the Goodwin Sands? How it is that to his name, who yesterday departed from the other world, we prefix so significant and infidel a word, and yet do not thus entitle him? if he but embarks for the remotest indies of this living earth, why the life insurance companies pay death forfeitures upon immortals, in what eternal, unsteering paralysis and deadly hopeless trance yet lies antique Adam, who died sixty round centuries ago. How it is that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dueling in unspeakable bliss, why all the living so strive to hush all the dead, wherefore but the rumour of a knocking in a tomb will terrify a whole city. All these things are not without their meanings. But faith, 
like a jackal feeds among the tombs, and even from these dead doubts she gathers her most vital hope. It needs scarcely to be told, with what feelings on the eve of an antiquate voyage. I regarded those marble tablets, and by the murky light of that darkened, doleful day read the fate of the whaleman who had gone before me. Yes, Ishmael, the same fate may be thine, but somehow I grew merry again. Delightful inducements to embark, fine chance for promotion, it seems. Eh, a stove boat will make me an immortal by brevet. Yes, there is death in this business of whaling. A speechlessly quick, chaotic bundling of a man into eternity. But what then? Methinks we have hugely mistaken this matter of life and death. Methinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is my true substance. Methinks that in looking at things spiritual, we are too much like oysters observing the sun through the water and thinking the thick water the thinnest of air. Methinks my body is but the less of my better being. In fact, take my body, who will. Take it, I say. It is not me. And therefore, three cheers for Nanticket. And come a stove boat and stove body, when they will, for stave my soul, Jove himself cannot. I hope you enjoyed this. Hadebra.